Good morning, everyone. I'm going to talk about Karen Reed. If you don't know about this case, if you don't know about this trial, you need to know about it. This thing is scheduled to happen in April. This is unlike any case, any trial that I have ever seen in my entire career at Court TV. This one is different. It is way different. And it's actually an important case because of the way things have developed here. Significant case, not just, oh, another case. Uh, no, no, this is different because of the allegations that are going back and forth on this one. Allegations going back and forth. There are two, there, there are two trials that are going to happen at once here. One based upon what the, the prosecution says happened and one based upon what the defense says happened. And the defense has been very specific in their allegations here. Very, very specific. So get ready for this one. <clears throat> this one, whoo, going to blow your mind. I've never seen anything like it. And, and just the way everything has developed and the headlines that have been coming out of this one. It's it's different. It's different. You, you've had a case where prosecutors have changed their mind on this a little bit. The defense has changed their mind on this a little bit. Um, and it's not really clear what's going on. It is not clear. I have no idea what the truth is in this one. I understand what both sides are saying. I don't know if either side has it 100% right as to what happened here. But if you don't know about this case and you haven't heard about this case, we're going to do it right now. We're going to get you ready for that trial. Now, I'll warn you off the top. It's layered. Like it, 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 there are many layers and a lot of um, detail and nuance to this one. Okay. And it's, it's a trial you're going to have to pay attention to, like each witness, each argument, and, and everything that is happening here. Because there's a lot of moving parts, both for the prosecution and the defense. And, and the way this is all developed is really, really bizarre. But it all begins with this man, John O'Keefe. He was a, a police officer in Boston. Boston cop, right? Classic Boston cop, John O'Keefe. Uh, big guy. You know, tough cop, but but kind of like a softy on, on the other side, right? Um, and pretty amazing guy uh, when you think about where he was in his life. Um, so he's a Boston police officer, and he's he's raising his his um, niece and nephew, right? He's raising kids um, because he was kind of like, okay, well, they lost their parents. I'm the closest relative. I'm going to raise these kids. So here he is as like a, a single man, a cop, uh, raising kids, like something you would see like in a television show or a movie. But he was doing it. Big heart. Um, heard a lot of good things about John O'Keefe. But also the classic Boston cop, right? They're kind of tough. They're kind of tough. You have to be. He's a big guy, too. Um. And he had a girlfriend and their relationship, it depends who you ask how this relationship was. Her name's Karen Reed. Um, it's been described as they were on the outs and they were fighting and things were horrible to things were fine between these two. And, and there's, there's, there's going to be two pictures that will be painted inside that courtroom. And you got to figure out which one you believe as, as, a, as a juror, as someone watching this. <clears throat> and then on the other hand, you've got um, what happened the night, the night of this case, okay? And a couple different ways to look at what was happening. Um, there's, they're out. They go out for a night of fun right a night of drinking and they're doing some bar hopping and it's a cold massachusetts night um and there's an incoming storm right 
not the biggest blizzard of all time. And that's another thing both sides don't agree on. It's like, how big of a snowstorm was this? But there was a snowstorm coming and it absolutely snowed. Um, and they're going bar hopping. John O'Keefe is not driving. Karen Reed is driving. Now, is she drinking and driving? I, I think you can say that. They've got surveillance video from inside the... Um, the bars where they were. So, you know, that Karen Reed was drinking. John O'Keefe was drinking and John O'Keefe, uh, I think took his drink with him from one of the bars and got into the car. Now they bumped into people that they knew. Uh, it's kind of a small town, Canton, Massachusetts. Um, and they're, uh, having a good time and there's nothing wrong with that. Right now, were they fighting that night? The defense says no. Prosecution says, yeah, there were problems. There were problems that they were, you know, there, there was some, some friction there in the relationship that things weren't just weren't right. And they're going to use that, the prosecution, to try to buttress their motivation, their motive for why Karen Reed would do what she's accused of doing here. So they go bar hopping. Then they bump into some friends and they're invited to an after party at a house. And it's a house of a, of a police officer. Okay, that makes sense. All right, it's a little after party. The bars are closed down. We're all getting together at this house. Come on over. Everyone's going to be there. So Karen and John drive there. Again, Karen is driving. John is the passenger. And then once they arrive at the house, and, and, and that's where everything you're going to hear inside the courtroom takes a drastic um, separation, like from what you're going to hear from the prosecution and what you're going to hear from the defense. I'll start with the prosecution case because that's why we're in court. We're not in court because of the defense making allegations. Uh, it's part of their defense of, of the allegations made by prosecutors. And the DA says that Karen Reed and John O'Keefe are fighting. They pull up to the house to go inside and they're in an argument, whatever. Things aren't great. And he gets out and she says she's not going to go into the after party. So John O'Keefe gets out. Karen Reed, then while making a three-point turn, which I call a K-turn, right? You're parked here and you pull that way, then you pull that way, then you pull that way. So you can go back in the direction that you came from. And they say while making this three-point turn, she purposely backed her car into John O'Keefe, knocked him down onto the ground, the front yard of that home, and left him there to die in the cold on purpose. On purpose. This is not an... This, originally, we thought this was going to be an accidental case, right? Oh, she's drunk, she's accidental, and she didn't know what she was doing, and then she didn't admit any of it, blah, blah, blah. No. No, they're saying that she did it purposely. And a couple of reasons why they're alleging that it's done purposely from what I can ascertain from everything that's happened in the courtroom um, is that she was angry with him. She was mad. Um, and that's sort of the motivation behind it. There were problems in the relationship. And number two, the backup cameras were working. Like, you know, in all your cars, you back up your car, you can see what's behind you and you boop, 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 boop. You hear the beeps, everything else. And they say they tested the car and everything was working. So they believe she knew that he was there in the screen. She knew what she was doing and backed into him and left him um, on, the, on the front lawn to die. That's what they say happened. Karen Reed has a different story. And they've been very aggressive with it. And they've said that she dropped him off. She drove home. He went into the party. Something happened in the party. And there was some altercation. And John O'Keefe was attacked inside that house. And then his body was dragged out onto the front lawn. And from that point forward, the responding officers, the lead investigator... Um, all conspired together to um, 
push attention away from people that were inside that house and point the finger and frame Karen Reed for this. That's the gist of it. That's the gist of it. Now, a lot of things happen. Like the next morning, Karen Reed is worried about where John is because he didn't come home. She was staying at his house. Um, and then she calls some people who were at the party who weren't, who didn't stay at the house. And she backs the car out of the garage, out of the garage and, and, and seems to strike uh, another car with her right tail light in the driveway. Um, that will be disputed whether she actually struck the car or didn't strike the car. But it's the right tail light, the same right tail light that prosecutors say struck John O'Keefe. So you see how things are starting to get complicated already. And then she, um, they finally get to the scene and Karen Reed, according to prosecutors, is the first one to spot his body. Nobody else knows, sees him, but she knows right away. That's another reason why they're charging her. Somehow she knew is what prosecutors are saying. She knew because she's the one that struck him and then runs over and says, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him. So they're saying that she admits to it. She knew where he was when they arrived in the morning uh, after the snowfall that night. And she did it all on purpose. Now she's claiming that when she got there, she found him. She, she no idea what was going on. And then all these other people are figuring out a way to frame her. Um, by putting pieces of the tail light on his body and doing all these other things. Now, one of the crucial pieces of evidence in the case, and I'm, I'm just giving you a thumbnail sketch of this, okay? The, the, the layers of this trial go even deeper, which is why you must watch this trial. You must watch this trial. Um, is that there's a Google search that um, is found on the phone of one of the women Who's there? The defense says the Google search is done at 2.30 in the morning. They res She responded like 6.30 in the morning, right? So 6.30 in the morning is when Karen Reed is there with these other people and they find John on the lawn. But the Google search is how long to die in a cold. Okay, it's spelled wrong. It's H-O-S instead of H-O-W. But how long to die in a cold is the Google search. The defense says prosecutors were hiding that evidence from them initially and that it that evidence proves that it wasn't her because they claim that that search is done at 2.30 in the morning. So if that search, that Google search is done 2.30 in the morning, how long to die in the cold before his body's even found, that means Karen has nothing to do with it. It was someone in the house because that's the phone. One of the women who's in the house doing that, that Google search, how long to die in the cold. It couldn't be Karen Reed. Like that, that's the smoking gun. Here's the problem. Um, is that the experts are going to disagree about this. Now there's uh, someone from the FBI, and we'll get into the whole federal aspect of this, um, who agrees that it's a 230 search. Obviously the defense experts going to say it's a 230 search. But apparently prosecutors will have an expert come in and say, no, that search was actually done at 630 in the morning when Karen Reed told her to search for that on her phone because they found him lying in the snow. So was the search done at 630 or 230? I always thought these issues were very straightforward with, you know, digital evidence like you find on your phone. But these experts are going to disagree. And I'm shocked. I'm shocked that this is an issue, but it is one of the biggest issues in the case. Because if the jury believes that it's at 2.30, the search, I, I feel like it would be impossible to convict her. But if this other expert uh, somehow comes across more credible, or what he's saying makes more sense to the jury, then maybe they don't believe that. But the defense is convinced, absolutely convinced that this search was done at 2.30. Yes, Starlar, absolutely. You have to take notes for this one. I'm, I'm telling you, it's this layered, it's this deep. And I'm just giving you like the, you know, just some of the headlines across the top. So you have some, some context and foundation for this trial. And this one, for, for whatever reason, has been a little bit under the radar. 
this case has been a little bit under the radar. Like I've known about this case since it happened and it just got more and more um, layered, complicated and, and interesting to follow as more things developed. And we heard more in the courtroom and outside of the courtroom. Um, now here's the other part of the case is what has happened. Karen Reed has become a folk hero. Um, there's a, a, a local, um, they call him a, a blogger, but you know, he's on YouTube. Um, his name is Turtle Boy, and he's covered this case in depth, and he has a lot of followers and has been going through the evidence. There's hundreds of videos, and there are hundreds and hundreds of people who believe uh, Karen Reed is innocent and being wrongfully prosecuted, and they show up at the courthouse. They show up at the courthouse and cheer for her and support her every time, like at pretrial motions. This doesn't happen. I mean, this does not happen. People don't show up to a courthouse to protest and support someone accused of murdering a great guy like John O'Keefe. That just doesn't happen. But they feel this is injustice. They believe this is a, a police cover-up, a conspiracy, and an attempt to frame an innocent woman. And they believe it passionately. Okay. She has tormented the victim's family friends. I stand for the key family. You look the other way. I don't know if you're talking to me or not, but I've said from the beginning, and if you watch my show, I have continually said, continuously said, I don't know what the truth is here. The truth needs to come out in the courtroom. And we've put on all the evidence for both sides, everything that's filed in court. We have shown in their entirety all of the hearings, the pretrial hearings, so everyone can hear both sides of this. And Karen Reed's presumed innocent, and it's the burden is on the prosecution to prove the case beyond any and all reasonable doubt. And in this case, the defense says, this woman is wrongfully accused, and we know who did it. So despite the fact that they have no burden, they've, they've placed some level of a burden on themselves, on themselves, to prove something in that courtroom. Now, legally, you have no burden to prove anything. But it seems like they are going to carry that burden somewhat into the courtroom. Now, for me, it's about justice. I'm a former prosecutor, and justice means one thing and one thing only, the truth. The truth to come out inside the courtroom. Now, there's some troubling facts that are taking place here in, in terms of <clears throat> the investigation and the way things have progressed here. Is for some reason, and again, that's debated as well, there's been an independent federal investigation of the investigators in this case in an ongoing murder case. That's unusual. Very unusual. I mean, the only times we've seen that uh, sometimes are in cases that are uh, racially charged or, or, or allegations of, of something along those lines. And I've seen those cases where the feds have come in and said, oh, is there a civil rights violation here? We're investigating that. But this is a little different. Like this is a... Um, a very ordinary murder case, right? When I say ordinary, I mean, it's, it, there was no, like we've had cases like this before, boyfriend, girlfriend, spouses with allegations of murder. And never have I seen a federal investigation inserted in this. The only time I've seen the feds get involved in cases, which is like in like Derek Chauvin, and, and the George Floyd case, Ahmaud Arbery, the case in Georgia, and, and other cases around the country that are usually racially charged and there's some pressure on the feds to come in and take a look at the local police to see if they were um, investigating things properly. But never in a case like this have I seen that. <clears throat> so where exactly are we in all of this? Well, what I want to play for you, um, 
is, well, before I get to that, there's a, a moment inside, let me see if I can find it. Because I said this is unlike any case I've ever covered. And I've covered a, a trial before in that same courthouse in Dedham, Massachusetts. And let's see, that's, is that this one? Let's see. Okay. And that was, so I'm going to show you this. I don't remove it. Because this is, this moment was unlike any moment I've ever seen in a courtroom. And, I, I, and like I said, I've been in this courtroom. And again, she's been accused of, of murdering a police officer. Right? So she's an accused cop killer. That's who Karen Reed is. Right? They're not saying it's an accident. They're saying this is on purpose. And I've never seen someone like that have this level of support and this level of what's happening at the courthouse. Like These supporters are showing up. And, and watch what happened when she walked into the courtroom at, at one of her hearings. <laughs> Um, hold on a second. Let me fix my uh, audio. One moment. Need a flashlight for this one. I cannot hear what's going on in the air here. There we go. Anyhow, I presume you heard it. I couldn't hear it. The speakers are shut off here. But applause, applause walking into a courtroom, applause going into a courtroom for someone accused of murder. Completely unusual, unlike any case I've ever seen in my decades at Court TV, covering cases around the country, around the country. I've never seen support for someone accused of what she's accused of. That makes this so different. And the aggressive nature of the defense in, in pointing fingers at specific people before the trial. Before the trial. Sometimes, you know, the defense kind of whips this stuff out during the course of the trial, trying to put the prosecution on their heels. But that's that's not where they are in this. They're doing it ahead of time. It's just not done. It's just not done that way. Again, makes this so different. All right, give me one second because I have to. I have to be able to monitor the sound, and I'm just trying to find why this is not working for me. One second. I'll be right back. Oh, there it is. I got it. Hold your ears. There you go. Whoa! There we go. Now the sound is at least happening. Um, I had to do another podcast this morning. All right. Now let's take a listen because uh, I have tried to outline what they're alleging here, but they're actually alleging it on the steps of the courthouse. Take a listen. That's what that's what we're trying to figure out. That's exactly what we're trying to figure out. The Massachusetts. Well, who do you think it is? well certainly the Massachusetts State Police is involved. Uh, there are there are people that were in that house that are involved. Brian Albert is, is involved. Uh, Jennifer McCabe is involved. The rest of the folks that were in that house. There's some level of involvement by every one of them. It feels we're the only ones fighting for the truth of what happened to John O'Keefe. And me and my family and my attorneys and my team have marshaled every resource to get to the truth. Just feels like no one else wants it. Karen, just to be clear, you didn't do it. We know who did it, Steve. We know. And we know who spearheaded this cover-up. You all know. This game is over. We know what happened inside the house. We just don't know who struck the fatal blow. And the prosecution, it doesn't seem to want to get to the bottom of it. We're trying to. On a Friday night in January 2022, Karen Reed and her boyfriend, Boston Police Officer John O'Keefe, joined friends for drinks. We were happy, having fun, laughing. 
uh, just very normal. Did you ever feel you were overserved that night, as no. they say? No, no. When she woke early, John wasn't there. She went out searching and 6 a.m. found him lying unresponsive in the snow and bitter cold in front of the home where she dropped him. His eyes were swollen shut. He had blood dripping out of his nose. She blurted out her thoughts as first responders arrived. Did you say, I wonder if I hit him? Did I said, I, did I kill him? I said, could I have hit him? What does the defense believe actually happened to John after Karen dropped him off? I think he walked into the house. Uh, I think he was confronted, was likely brought down to the basement. I think that confrontation got physical and he was beaten. He was beaten to an, a, a point of unconsciousness. He's got some defensive wound bruises on the backs of his hand. He's got this massive laceration on the back of his head, a big giant gash, about two and a half inches, exactly lateral, uh, going from left to right. Two black eyes, cut over his right eye, cut over his nose. This was a cover-up that John was murdered inside that house. Okay, so those are the allegations. Really specific, like naming people. Naming people that are responsible, according to the defense. Now you have to put this all in perspective. You, you put the pieces together, they're alleging some level of coordination between the people in the house, the responders who were investigating, and when you when you follow it all the way through, there's the Google search that they're saying was done at 2.30. But then when you look at some of the forensics in the case, the taillight, DNA, they're going to allege that it's actually planted evidence. Not like misinterpreted, not like overlooked. Now they didn't find, no, that some of this evidence that's being used against Karen Reed in this prosecution was actually planted. So the, the level of the coordination is a massive cover-up frame of Karen Reed. And that's what they're saying. So this is going to play out as the case against Karen Reed is playing out because it'll play out through the cross-examination of witnesses. The defense often makes their case. In most cases, they usually don't have any evidence, but they try to make their case and put it together while they're cross-examining the state's witnesses as the state is trying to put their case together. And again, it gets back to my headline. This is why you, this is a trial you must see. Many of the cases on court TV, the defense is, ah, oh, they can't prove it. Ah, oh, the evidence just isn't there. Right? And that's because of the way our system's set up with the burden of proof. And that's a legitimate defense, but it's 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 not a search for the truth by both sides, right? Like here, both sides say, we know what happened. And we're going to show you in court what happened. The evidence is going to show you what happened here. Not they can't prove it. No, we're going to show you what really happened here. That's, again, what makes this case so different. The public reaction and the scene at the courthouse. Every time. Dozens and dozens of people with signs, et cetera, at pre-trial hearings, not even at the trial. Like they're having emotion. Like emotion for whatever. Like these things in most cases are very ordinary courtroom appearances. And so the lawyers show up, the defendant shows up, no one's in the gallery. Sometimes if it's a big case, the news is there. Sometimes they're not even there. This one, again, is different. And I don't know why the troll mafia believes that I have a stake in all of this. Why do you support this egregious level? I don't support witness intimidation. Like, I don't. What I do is report on everything that's happening and open the microphones to all sides of every case, like I always do. It's just that it's rare that the defense speaks. They spoke to me. They spoke to ABC. They spoke to NBC. Prosecutors speak through charge, their charging documents. 
I mean, they, they rarely talk once the case has been um, indicted because ethically in most jurisdictions and every jurisdiction has slightly different rules. In most jurisdictions, prosecutors don't speak. They'll speak in a very limited fashion after the trial. Um, sometimes they'll make an announcement when there's an arrest or charges and they'll, uh, they'll, they'll talk about what those charges are. Um, but they're sort of hamstrung by what they can say. And in this case, and in most cases, the defense is not. And in this case, the defense spoke a lot. The prosecution also spoke addressing all of these issues and accusing the defense and indicting Turtle Boy for witness intimidation. For the, for the protests and the allegations and the bullhorns and the showing up at the house. And the man who was leading the protests in this case is now being prosecuted by the same office that's prosecuting Karen Reed. Which again is another reason why you must watch this case. I mean, one or two, well, there's like three outcomes here. There's three potential outcomes. One is she's convicted and it's over. Like she's convicted, like she'll appeal, et cetera. But like, okay, she's convicted. The jury has spoken. Um, they believe exactly what the prosecution has alleged here. Now you can have a not guilty, which means 12 people agree the prosecutors didn't prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt, which then sort of opens the door to, well, if they didn't believe this happened, what do they believe? If the jury speaks afterwards, which they're permitted to do, are they going to tell us that they believe the defense theory or are they going to say, well, there just wasn't enough. I don't know. We thought the defense theory was, was a strong possibility or, or a reasonable alternative explanation for what happened. And that's why they voted not guilty. Or you could have a hung jury where the jury can't agree. Like these attorneys can't agree. Like the public so far can't agree as to what happened here. So, and I don't know, like if you watch my show, I say every time, because I know of, of the emotions and the passion that people have on both sides of this case. I'm just in search of the truth. And to me, the more we hear, the better we have a, an opportunity to understand the truth in a case. Now, inside a courtroom, there are limitations by the rules of evidence, hearsay, uh, and other rules that, that, that come up during the course of a case. So the jury doesn't get to see and hear every everything, but the public certainly can and can consider everything. And what's happening in this case is, is one of two things. Well, it could be three things because, you know, it could be that she did it on purpose. It could be that she'd been drinking. She didn't even realize that she did it. And it was uh, an accident that may, an accident that may, in fact, be criminal in nature, right? Because accidents can be criminal. Uh, he, he, that's the allegation against Alec Baldwin is the same thing. Some level of, of manslaughter. Um, those two results can happen. Or, or what, what happened here is that she was wrongfully accused. Our system is set up so that guilty people go free before one innocent person is convicted. So the deck is stacked for defendants in our system of justice. It just is. And you learn that when you're, when you're a prosecutor. Now I'll just address one more part of, oh, wait, here we go. We have more, uh, one more part of the, of the, the, um, complications of this case. Right? Because the defense is saying they want justice for John O'Keefe. But from their perspective, justice for John O'Keefe means Karen Reed didn't do it, someone else did it. And they believe the truth is somewhere else. It's not what prosecutors think. It's not what any investigators 
who took a look at this case believe. They believe justice for John O'Keefe is Karen Reed being convicted. But what justice really is, is the truth. Which is, and again, this is the difference between the prosecution and the defense in every case. The ethical obligation of prosecutors is justice seeking the truth. The ethical obligation of every defense attorney is to protect their client. And I've talked about this many, many, many times in different contexts. But if you apply that to this case, you apply that to this case. This DA, right, who's been attacked, his ethical obligation is not to just win a case. His ethical obligation is to the truth, whatever it is and wherever it leads him. And he believes, and I, I saw him make his announcement, his, his video that he released, passionately believes that the truth to him is very obvious as to what happened here based upon all the evidence. And you need to have that firm belief to charge someone. That is your ethical obligation. Now, on the other side of the coin, the defense in this case and in every case has zero obligation to the truth. There's no ethical obligation to the truth. That is not their job. That's not their role. Our system could not work that way. It couldn't work. Their job and ethical obligation is to do everything that is legal in the defense of their client and their client's interests. So you hear in courtrooms day in and day out around our country, and I've been listening to them for decades, arguments made by defense attorneys that... <clears throat> not necessarily based in truth. And I've, I've seen cases where they've explored different avenues of, of defenses, trying to find one that might resonate with the jury. Well, could have been this, could have been that, could have been this guy, could have been that guy. And they're permitted to do that under our system of justice. So the defense here is doing nothing wrong, but understand that ethically as a lawyer, who is a defense lawyer, you can say the evidence shows this, shows this and that, even if in your heart of hearts you don't necessarily believe that. Now, in this case, they're saying they believe it, but you don't ethically have to, but a prosecutor does. And when a prosecutor goes after someone, and a case is not based in fact or is motivated by something other than the truth, they get into trouble. Like the guy who went after the lacrosse players in North Carolina years ago. Got into big trouble because he was motivated by the politics of everything. Trying to get reelected. Thought it'd be popular to go after the Duke lacrosse players. Even though it wasn't the truth. I mean, he was hiding evidence, etc. So, but those are some of the allegations here that are being made by this defense team. So I don't know what the truth is. I got to hear the evidence. I got to see the witnesses. I've got to see them cross-examined. I want to hear the experts. I want to know what the experts' background is. And I want to hear their explanations here because you're going to have a battle of the experts when it comes to the um, medical examiners and the autopsy and the injuries on John O'Keefe, what they mean, what story they tell. You're going to have experts debating debating um, digital evidence from phones. So it, it, it... One second, I'm getting a text message. I have to check that. Okay. So it's not clear, right? So it's not clear until you get inside of a courtroom, testify, get cross-examined, and then you make a judgment based upon, all right, how does that jive with the rest of the evidence? What evidence is sort of irrefutable? 
And I've posed this question, right? When it comes to the truth in the case, right? Like what's the actual truth? Not can they prove it, but what is the truth of what actually happened? And I've, and I've asked this of, of my guests. And I said, okay, you're a former prosecutor. I'm a former prosecutor. You could prosecute the people in the house or you could prosecute Karen Reed. Where's there more evidence? Which of those two roads is there more evidence? Which one, which case, like if you wanted to pick one of those cases to try inside a courtroom, which one do you think you could win as a prosecutor? And I've answered that question on the air. I said the Karen Reed case, obviously, is a stronger case for the prosecution. And if prosecutors went into the courtroom trying to prove this conspiracy, that case would be over in two minutes because whoever you were charging in this conspiracy would say, would point the finger at Karen Reed and say, well, what about this evidence, that evidence, this evidence? And that's like reasonable doubt in five seconds. And, in, and you could also argue that, well, that's the way the case was investigated. You know, they, they, they didn't uncover everything. Okay, well, as it stands right now, based upon what's been made public so far, if you're looking, if you're looking at two files, one file is the case against the people in the house and, and all the investigators afterwards, and the other file is against Karen Reed. Obviously, there's more evidence in the Karen Reed file. Obviously. But now you got to try the case. And and there there are cases that we've covered on Court TV where it, there, there's, there's, you don't know. At the end of it, you just don't know what happened because of all the other issues and reasonable doubt that exist. You don't know, even if you believe you know, you don't actually know. And in the case, Tara Grinstead, this woman from Osceola, Georgia, was a teacher. She was a um, beauty pageant contestant, real nice woman. Disappeared, never found. And years later, after a podcast, Up and Vanished, um, a guy named Bo Dukes comes forward and says, I helped get rid of the, the get rid of the body. And it was Duke that did it. So it was Dukes and Duke, right? Ryan Duke and Bo Dukes. They weren't related, but they went to high school together. And prosecutors, based upon what Bo Dukes told them and the other evidence in the case went after Ryan Duke. But when Ryan Duke was being tried, he got convicted of disposing of the body with Bo Dukes. But at the end of the day, the jury didn't know which one of them actually committed the, the ultimate crime. So no one was ever held responsible. I mean, is that possible here? I mean, it's a different case. But sometimes the evidence is just that way. That that there's there's not enough on either either road to prove prove it to a jury beyond a reasonable doubt, which is such a high standard, such a high burden. But to believe that the defense theory is reasonable, you are going to have to believe that there is a coordinated effort coordinated effort by law enforcement and the people in the house to frame and plant evidence regarding Karen Reed. That's their case based upon what I've seen and heard so far in the courtroom and in the interviews that I've done. That's the bottom line to all of this. That is the bottom line. A juror to find reasonable doubt on that theory, we'll have to believe that that theory is reasonable. And we'll see. We'll see what the evidence shows. Like if, if you have text messages or some sort of, some level of coordination between these people who are alleged to be part of the conspiracy, then maybe the jury buys it. Maybe that is the truth if, if you have that evidence. So, there is, there is, well, there's no legal burden on the defense here. There's going to be a burden on them to try to tie some of those pieces together 
in order for a juror to say, okay, that's an alternative, reasonable explanation as to what happened to Officer John O'Keefe. That's where you have to, and, and again, I'll get back to my premise here. I'm not trying the case from one side or the other. What I'm telling you is laying out what this trial is going to look like. And it's going to look like, unlike any other case in the history of court TV. Because of the passion, because of what has happened in the, in the lead up to this trial, the people involved, and the, and the cross allegations. This is more, I mean, you see cross allegations in civil cases, right? I'm suing you for this. Well, you're suing me for that. I'm going to counter sue you for that. That's kind of what, what the defense is doing here. You're going to charge her with murder? Well, we're going to accuse you of committing this murder and covering it up and framing her. Now, I, I was trying to, you know, I was thinking back and, and if there's ever been a case where it's been proven at trial that, that, that someone was framed by law enforcement, and I, I can't, I cannot recall one in the history of court TV. Now, there are cases where, you know, one defendant is framed by another defendant, right? Like I've, I've seen those. I don't think I've ever seen it in this context and to this level. Now, the, the problem for prosecutors is that the, fed, the feds, like the Department of Justice, the FBI, is doing an investigation of the investigators here. And the results of their investigation are being shared with the prosecution and defense. When has that ever happened? Like during the course in the buildup to a murder trial, which is going to happen in April. But at the same time, the feds are investigating the people who investigated the, def the defendant and then sharing all that information. This is bizarro world. It's never happened. Never, ever, 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 ever happened. Let's see. Jennifer McCabe did nothing wrong. And yeah, like she's not accused of anything, but she's being accused by the defense. And we'll see what the defense shows up with. Yes, Gen X, I get it. I get it. Okay, let's see. Uh, why don't you speak about the forensic facts like DNA? I did. I did. I did. I did. Here's the thing about this. I'm not trying this case for both sides. I'm giving everyone this view. If you've been watching the video, I said from the beginning, this is extremely layered, extremely detailed, this case. And I think in the comments, apparently, you're seeing um, the passions on both sides here. And I get it. No one likes being accused of something they didn't do. Whether you're a defendant, if you didn't do it, or you're just an innocent member of the public connected to the victim in the case. You don't like it. Now... What's interesting is, um, one second. I spoke with uh, Ben Chu, who is an expert in defamation law, libel law. He was the guy who represented Johnny Depp. And I presented this story to him, and, and he talked about, um, because people are being accused of doing things here. And inside a courtroom, everything is pretty much protected. It's protected speech. And I guess it has to be for our system to, to function. Like, I guess the defense uh, or prosecution can make these accusations. But when those statements and accusations are made outside of a courtroom, then it's a different case. And, and I'm wondering, and I'm wondering if there'll be, you know, that part of the case. Hmm. 
Jordan, thanks for your objective coverage, freeing Karen, a step towards justice. You see, Deanna, I mean, people seeing this thing differently, you know, and I get it. I get why people are seeing it differently. Uh, yes, I have. I have had people on my show on both sides of this story and this case. I absolutely have. <clears throat> and Robin, thank you. Robin from New Hampshire. Very heated today, very heated. And, and, you know, anytime you cover this story, like when we do this trial every day, my direct messages are going to blow up. Um, yeah, I, I get it. I get it. Um, so this trial is coming up in April on Court TV. You will see it. You will hear all the evidence and you can you make a decision. And hopefully, hopefully at the end of the case, there will be a verdict one way or the other. Rather than a, a split on the jury, the way members of the public and the folks in the chat rooms and everywhere else are apparently split on this one. <clears throat> Body was on the front lawn, about eight feet in. About eight feet in is the way uh, it's been described. Mel Carter saying the injuries don't match. Again, the, you're going to have experts talking about that. You're going to have experts talking about that. And they're not going to agree. And it's not unusual in a case that you're going to have, uh, in most cases where there's expert testimony, there's usually an expert on both sides. So this is where the jury has to listen to what the experts say, evaluate the experts' um, level of experience in all of this and then see how it matches up with the other evidence in the case and that's oftentimes what i've seen jurors do is they'll look at what this expert said what that expert said and then look at the independent evidence that doesn't go one way or the other that is what it is that that is not really up for interpretation and says okay does this expert's opinion match that evidence or does the other expert's opinion match that evidence? And we saw experts in the Murdoch case. And, and Kenny Kinsey was, I mean, the way he talked, the way he explained it, just um, oozed of, of credibility. And the jury understood that. And I think the folks who watched the trial understood it. And ultimately, uh, Murdoch was convicted. Uh, that case was not not as big a case about expert testimony, but it was a facet of it. This case, much bigger, much bigger. <laughs> People think I'm paid to do this. I am not paid by anyone to do anything other than do my television show in which for decades we've been uh, doing. All right. Julie Grant has it right. Come here. Just trolling, uh, not trolling, <laughs> troll. I'm not trolling, but people are trolling. I'm scrolling through some of the, um, you need mods. That's true. All right, folks, I got to wrap it up here. I've got a, um, another podcast I've got to do. I'm a get, actually a guest on that one. Uh, Lauren Katie has her blood on top of the snow if he died when Karen Reed left. That's going to be another issue. That's going to be another issue. It snowed after Karen Reed, I believe. So that's more expert testimony there, Lauren. More expert 
testimony on this one. I wouldn't say it's a weird case. I would say it's an unusual case. And unlike any case we've ever covered. This is amazing. This is amazing. I'm just reading some of these comments. Like, um, okay, we're going to get them. We're going to get those moderators, JN, for sure. This is interesting because this just happened. They want to create a uh, buffer zone outside of the courthouse. I, I've seen that done in other cases. It's been done in other cases um, where they set up a zone for protesters. Usually there's protesters on both sides of a case, but um, there, there is there's the balance of the uh, First Amendment freedom of expression, but then they've got to keep things safe. And they also have to, in this case, in, in Dedham, Massachusetts, um, protect the jury. Now, the last trial I covered in Dedham, the, the jury would meet, because it was high profile as well, the jury would meet at an undisclosed location. The uh, deputies would pick up that jury and then bring the jury in um, and sort of not sneak them in, but bring them into the courthouse. And that's this small town uh, courthouse. You know, there's a couple doors, as I recall, a front entrance and a back entrance to get into the uh, courthouse. So um, we'll see how they handle that. I think they may create some restrictions on where you can be. And I think they've done that already. Uh, but I don't know if they're going to try to put them across the street. Um, but I have seen that in other cases. You know, in the buildup to the uh, Derek Chauvin, George Floyd case, they built places for people to be. Uh, the same happened in Ahmaud Arbery, although in that case, they were much closer to the courtroom. It's a safety thing for the witnesses, uh, for the jury and everything else. So that's the balance that the court will have to do. Um, but I, I think there will be some restrictions and some parameters set up for where folks can be um, by the courthouse, which is... Um, more common, again, I would say, in cases where you're talking about um, a racially charged trial. Yeah, this is good. People, yeah, you start insulting, people don't hear you. Billy, how are you, Billy? I'll tell you what's up. Everybody got all upset today. Everybody got all upset today. And that tells you the nature, Billy, of this trial that you must watch on Court TV. All uh, right, people are arguing this. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this is amazing. I think I saw that movie, right? The Departed, The Departed. Right there, you get Boston police had a, but th this isn't Boston police. This is Canton and the Massachusetts state police. This is, was not investigated by the Boston police. So um, despite the fact that they had a little history there with, I think Whitey and everyone else and the uh, local FBI had problems there as well. I mean, yeah, there's a little bit of history there. Uh, this is, this is a little different than that uh, type Hello, Maria. Great to see you. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, we shall see. We shall see. Like I said, folks, it's heated, but you have to see it. And it, and I, and I get it, you know, both sides, nobody likes being accused of something they didn't do. And the, the truth will come out in the courtroom. But at this point, everyone, everyone is presumed innocent. 
everyone is presumed innocent, but members of the public are allowed to have their opinions, right? That presumption of innocence is how our system treats people. It is how um, a jury is instructed and how a jury must accept a defendant. But in our country, because of the freedom we have, people can have whatever opinions they want. And in cases where some of the evidence has come out, not all of it, where some of the evidence has come out, people are allowed to have their opinions. And, and that's what's happening here uh, in this particular case. But the opinions are, are very uh, passionate and very specific. And the allegations that have been made by Turtle Boy and others seemingly are being echoed in the courtroom by Karen Reed's attorneys. So it gives you a flavor for how this whole thing um, will go down. Oh, Joyce, I just have to point something out. Joyce, the martini glasses in the background. These, these were actually court TV swag. I don't know if you can see it. Can you see it? It says it's got the court TV logo on it. And years ago, it used to light up. And this part here was like a little DNA strand. So it's a little DNA strand. It's old, old, old Core TV swag that I kept uh, for all these years. But actually, don't. Uh, mm. And mufflers. That's a question the defense, I think, would have to answer. Would have to answer. Is it just to protect the people inside the house because they're all somewhat friendly? That's the great question. And, and, and you'll hear that, I am sure, from the district attorney's office, from the Commonwealth, from the prosecution. Why would they go after her mm -hmm. yeah some fiery comments and questions today <laughs> okay all right, so sh we shall see. We shall see. Um, thank you, everyone. Even the trolls. Even the trolls. Just don't make it personal because there's nothing personal about it from my perspective. I said I have, no, I have no dog in the race, horse in the race, um, but one agenda, which is to see the evidence come out and see the truth come out inside the courtroom. And if you report this case and you don't report what the defense is saying, ethically, ethically, as a journalist, you're not doing your job. You're just not doing your job. And I've reported both sides here. Now, like in the, matter, the Madeline Soto case, it's difficult to report the defense side because they haven't spoken. They haven't said anything. So we report what we know. And we report who is saying what. Like he made statements in the Soto case. Stefan Sturz made statements. We reported what he said. We took a look at his story. We reported his story. That he dropped the little girl off. But we're also reporting the prosecution story. I think you have to understand the way this works. In the courtroom and and in in the media. I've been covering cases for decades. Uh, always, always have explained what both sides are alleging and arguing in every trial I've ever covered. Every trial, you don't avoid one side, and and that's what you see sometimes in. Some of these uh, podcasts and docu-series, et cetera, 
or they really latch on to one side and not the other, and they don't tell the complete story. Well, the beauty of court TV is you get both sides because we show you all the evidence. So you hear the witnesses, you hear the testimony. When papers are filed in court, we'll talk about them. Much more even. Much more even. Why? Because we're doing our jobs. And we have our opinions based on the evidence. But I've said from the beginning, I don't have an opinion on this one. I have an opinion on Stephen Stearns based on what I've heard so far. This one I don't. This one I don't. I, I, I could tell you, you know, what my initial reaction was to this story was, oh, they're out drinking and someone got hit by a car. That makes sense. I've seen that before. Driving under the influence. And striking someone. But that's not the allegation here. The allegation isn't some accident. The allegation is something else. So in reality, the truth could be what the prosecution is alleging. It could be what the defense is alleging. It could be something in the middle. Something that neither is alleging at this point. Although at some point, both sides seem to be alleging this. That it was an accident. We shall see. Carry on. Carry on. Um, all right. I've got a roll. Uh, I've got another interview that I've got to do, but I appreciate uh, all the support. I appreciate the um, lively chat. And um, I'll, I'll try to read some more of these comments because, again, as I'm doing the show and speaking, I can't keep up with what people are saying. Uh, but we will get those uh, moderators inside the chat because apparently people are getting very personal and that's not good argue the evidence don't make it personal all right thank you um don't forget tonight eight o'clock eight to ten court tv two hours live every night monday through friday then i've got my show on the weekends at 10 a.m and we're also currently filming season two of Accomplice to Murder. I'm Vinny Politan. Have a great day. And please don't forget to hug the kid.